By the end of 1941, guests were flooding into Walter Knott's ghost town village at his Knott's Berry Place. Yes, it was still named that. Over the past few years, an odd assortment of collections and displays had birthed an entire western town. And now, what started as a way to distract people waiting to eat in his wife's chicken dinner restaurant had become an attraction in and of itself. But Walter didn't want to charge people an entrance fee to see his little town. So instead, he turned to concessions. Before we get to the concessionaires, we need to look at why Walter Knott didn't want to charge admittance to the ghost town. The short version is that making money wasn't really the point. The ghost town was meant to entertain and educate while people waited to spend money in the restaurant. That latter point, education, was important to Knott. He wanted people to see a portrayal, as accurate as he could manage, of what he believed life was like for the early pioneers in the deserts of the Old West part of that meant some of the buildings needed to be functional. The hotel housed the cyclorama, so that obviously wasn't going to operate as a real hotel. Nor was the mule and mine supply shop going to sell animals and pickaxes. And the less said about the brothel, the better. But the Ghost Town News would publish a genuine magazine filled with stories of the Old West, both true and fiction. It was edited by Nichols Field Wilson, a former stockbroker from Los Angeles that became one of the biggest early cheerleaders of the Knott's Berry Place. There's not a lot of detail available about these printings, and there are some extant prints that contradict the depiction in some otherwise reliable sources, so it's hard to say exactly how many editions they created, how many of each edition got printed, or anything like that. What is indisputable is that the Ghost Town News didn't last all that long, only about five years before they published their final edition in 1946. The Silver Dollar Saloon was another of the original Ghost Town buildings that actually functioned. Sure, the Knots weren't actually serving rot gut whiskey from behind the bar, the only drink available was the same berry punch as in the chicken dinner restaurant, but it was a real working saloon nonetheless. In another effort at reality, Walter made sure his town was populated. A self-taught woodcarver named Andy Anderson filled Knott's town with life-sized sculptures, the most popular being in the sheriff's office and jail. The figure in the jail, Sad-Eyed Joe, would become a Knott's Berry Place legend. He would greet guests by name, talk to them, and seem to know personal details about each of them. He's still incarcerated in the ghost town jail today, over 80 years later. And if you go and talk to him, he might actually know some things about you. A sense of reality is also why not insisted on using as much original materials as possible, and made sure any new materials were aged to match. One of his two staff artists named Paul, von Kleben in this case, was in charge of that aging process with the help of the farmhands. His other Paul, Swartz this time, was his first concessionaire. That wasn't also part of the family, at least. The true honor goes to Virginia Knott and her gift shop, which still exists today. When the young Swartz came to cut silhouettes for the crowds at Knott's, he was just passing through the area. But the business was so good, he stuck around. Once he became friends with Walter, he started helping as the first art director for the little western town, drawing up the layout of the buildings for Knott. He connected Knott with Paul von Kleben, who took over the responsibility of designing the ghost town buildings from Swartz after that first year. But as we noted last episode, the end of Ghost Town's first year was the beginning of World War II for the U.S. Nations in Europe and Asia had been battling the Axis powers for a couple years already, but the attack on Pearl Harbor drew the U.S. into direct combat. And despite the Knott family's survivor spirit, and their ability to provide relief for Americans stressed by the war, they were not immune from its effects. 
Rationing meant the menu for the chicken dinner restaurant needed to be scaled back, and also meant that, sometimes, they just ran out of things. That said, the chicken dinners that cost a mere 65 cents in 1934 were now selling, eight years later, for almost twice that, a buck 25 and a dollar 50 on Sundays and holidays. And the war didn't diminish crowds. It did delay some plans, though. Walter planned to have an Opry house installed, but the war put the kibosh on that. Same thing for a Buffalo Steak Cafe. Over the next few years, von Kleben designed a number of new buildings for the ghost town, some of which eventually got built, and some of which didn't. Two that did come into being were the Post Office and Wells Fargo Office, both built in 1942. Another 1942 addition was the Picture Gallery. Walter wanted to offer souvenir pictures. He recruited Gus Thornrose, a former newspaper photographer who already worked for the Knots taking pictures for their advertisements and nursery catalog. Thornrose ran the picture gallery with the help of Paul Swartz. While Swartz designed cutouts and sets for the customers to pose in, Gus took the souvenir pictures. They also sold postcards, caricatures, and tintypes. Clyde Finley, a farmhand who'd worked for the Knots since 1931, bought the concession in 1944 and ran it until 1971. Those three buildings were the only functional additions to Ghost Town until late in the war. But the facades of what would eventually become the Steakhouse and General Store also went up. For the next couple years, Paul von Kleben drew up architectural elevations for several more buildings to be added on a new street of the town, running just off of Main Street. The anchor for this expansion was going to be a recreation of the Birdcage Theater in Tombstone, Arizona, which would be another fully functioning replica. Melodramas and period plays would be performed for the guests, and tickets would be sold at the door. But that would take years to materialize. The first building of the new street to actually open was the Bottle House. Inspired by an actual house made of glass bottles and concrete in the Death Valley ghost town of Rhyolite, Nevada, the Bottle House opened in early 1945. Next door, and attached to the Bottle House, was the Music Hall. This became the new home of Walter's still-expanding collection of music boxes, as well as a painting from 1870 by artist Charles Christian Knoll called Night Watch. In 1945, Knott asked von Kleben to revisit the Buffalo Steak Cafe idea and come up with a new design. What von Kleben brought him would stand out even today as a high-concept themed restaurant. Guests would enter through the facade built back in 1942 into an adobe brick building. In the large lobby would be a lunch counter with tractor seat stools and a series of booths separated by a low wall. Off this entry would be three main dining rooms, the covered wagon room, the gold miners room, and the <coughs> Indian Room. The covered wagon room would feature a series of booths arranged in a circle, dressed as Conestoga covered wagons, all underneath a nighttime desert sky. The center of the room would be a large, fully functioning grill, encased in a facade of stone and dressed to resemble a campfire, with a fake Joshua tree at the center to hide the grill's vent hood. The gold miner's room was even more ambitious, featuring a mining town of rundown buildings, a running river, and a series of narrow gauge tracks for the wait staff to deliver food to the tables using real mine carts. Unsurprisingly, this was all too ambitious and too expensive, even for Walter Knott. The only part of the plan to actually get built was the Indian room. The chairs were themed as tom-tom drums, and paintings of famous Native American chiefs adorned the walls. Even this was a far cry from the original design of von Kleben. The steakhouse opened in the fall of 1946. The restaurant was run by Marion Knott's husband, Dwight Anderson, whom she'd met at USC a few years earlier, before she dropped out in her junior year and came back to work on the farm. A fire destroyed the restaurant's patio area on November 15, 1950, but Walter Knott, his son Russell, 
Dwight Anderson, and the farm crew had it restored in less than a fortnight. Around this time, Walter Knott began hiring people to play characters in his ghost town. One of the first was a man named Jim Lewis, an old vaudeville performer who played a sheriff character, taking pictures, telling jokes, and doing little dances for tips. Another was Rex Sands, who went by the nickname Dude. Dude owned a horse that could count, bow, and point directions with his front hoof. Dude and Mac, the educated horse, sat in the parking lot to welcome guests. Other early characters were played by Slim Vaughn, Bud Boydston, and Bud's father Gus. The post-war tourism boom is what finally turned Knott's Berry Place, the old roadside berry stand turned chicken dinner restaurant turned Wild West attraction, into the modern Knott's Berry Farm. The official name change came in 1947, along with a raft of additions and modifications that would continue through into the 50s. Largest of these was the opening of the general store. The facade had been built during the war, but it took years for Knott and his team to find enough vintage products to stock all the shelves and open it to the public. It wasn't an actual store at first. Instead, it was more of a display, showcasing what products were available for consumers a century before. It was also the central hangout of the growing cast of Ghost Town characters, and thus functioned as a sort of immersive theater environment. One of these new characters in Ghost Town was Chief Redfeather, portrayed by Jim Brady, son of Sue and Navajo parents. He quickly became one of the more popular characters at the farm, and was exceptional at getting tips from the guests, posing for pictures and jewelry and headdresses handmade by him and his wife. Other, more permanent characters were added in 1947 as well, in the form of Handsome Brady and Whiskey Bill. Whiskey Jim? Whatever. These concrete figures, the creations of artist Claude Bell, sat on a bench facing Main Street, along the side of the covered wagon cyclorama show, spaced apart to allow guests to sit with them and take a photo. They're still there to this day. But the general store and new faces around town were just parts of a much larger expansion. Market Street expanded to include Red's Leatherworks, run by William Red Walker, a gunsmith shop with a concrete gunsmith sculpted by Claude Bell, Fandango Hall, an antique shop, and a faithful recreation of Judge Roy Bean's Jersey Lily Saloon from Texas. This was also the year that Walter Knott and Paul von Kleben began devising their most elaborate attraction yet. 1948 was set to be the 100th anniversary of the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in Northern California. And Knott's ghost town, based on the towns of that era, couldn't let such a momentous occasion go to waste. So, starting in 1947, Knott worked with von Kleben to come up with a design for a gold mine attraction. After numerous revisions, they settled on a plan. They started by digging a pit in the parking lot, right in front of the new steakhouse restaurant. They piled the dirt from this hole into a berm between the ghost town and the chicken dinner restaurant, which also helped hide the view of Grand Avenue. This mountain covered the entire eastern side of the pit, making the difference in elevation seem larger from inside the new excavation. The area had two entrances when it opened in August 1948, one down a short flight of concrete stairs, and another through the mines. The mines were actually just a tunnel made of chicken wire and sand, coated in gunite and sculpted to look like rocks. Flecks of quartz and gold were embedded in the concrete to make it sparkle. The tunnel wound down into the pit, with blocked off branches into abandoned mine shafts. At the end of the tunnel, guests walked into the Pan for Gold attraction, where water, ran down through sluice boxes. Employees dressed as miners instructed visitors in how to use a pan to search for gold in the wet sand, just like prospectors did back in the 1800s. Any gold the guests found was placed in a commemorative vial for them, and they got to take it home. Walter Knott bought $10,000 worth of gold flecks per year just to salt the sand using the attraction, a task he did himself. And that wasn't the only place Walter Knott went above and beyond. In 1948, 
he instituted a revenue sharing program for his employees. That first year, he had $26,000, over $300,000 in today's money, distributed to the company's employees as thanks for all their hard work. He felt they should share in the profits of their labor and that such bonuses might inspire them to work even harder in the future. Paul von Kleben's next project after the gold mine borrowed heavily from the unused ideas for the Buffalo Steak Restaurant. With several musical acts already performing in the park, there wasn't a good place for them to put on a show except standing out in the streets. To solve this, von Kleben designed the wagon camp. Starting with old farm wagons bought from around the area, they converted them to look like Conestoga wagons of the 1800s. These were arranged in a circle around a large eucalyptus tree, half being used as a backdrop for the elevated stage and the other half being filled with seats. Between the half circle of wagons with seats and the stage, a gentle slope was dug and tiered bench seating for 800 people installed. The result was a rustic amphitheater for the park's musical acts to perform in. We've already met one of those performers, Bud Boydston, who led square dances and sing-alongs every week. Another early group was Shirley and her Beeman Brothers, a family act that featured a few members who would go on to play in the Wagon Masters, the Knott's Berry Farm house band of sorts, from 1955 to 1968. These regular acts were joined by celebrity performers, particularly those of a country and western flavor as well as high school groups and the occasional melodrama. In 1949, Walter visited a malt shop to find a woman who he'd heard on the radio playing old songs on a hammered dulcimer. Her name was Nellie McKinney. When Walter tracked her down, he offered her a job playing hymns on the front porch of a log cabin he'd recently acquired from Arkansas and installed near the new gold mine attraction. She accepted and was a staple of the park for the next 11 years, when she retired at the age of 90. A rooster would sometimes sit on top of the sound box and sing along with her playing, crowing like crazy. A stagecoach line was added in 1949, operated by Bill Higdon. This started right behind the wagon camp and took guests on a ride out to the perimeter of the farm property and back. Eventually, the stagecoach got its own ticket office next to the bottle house and music hall. A few months after the stagecoach opened, Walter built a 230-foot-long arena for the Mark Smith Horse Show, designed to seat 3,000 people. Mark Smith was a renowned horse trainer from Burbank who worked on numerous films for the big Hollywood studios. He and his family were specialists in doing tricks on horseback, and so this is what the show centered around. The new attraction opened on January 1st, 1950, and failed almost instantly. This was the first paid show at the park, and was competing with the free square dances and performances at the wagon camp. Visitors just weren't used to paying for much of anything in the park, but especially for the entertainment. And the rewatch value on the show was pretty low as well. As if all that weren't enough to kill it, the show couldn't run if there was rain, which meant no income on wet days in Southern California, which sees plenty of wet days. Even after the Mark Smith Horse Show closed its short run at the farm, the arena sat empty. For years. Russell Knott called it Walter's Folly. This rare misstep aside, the ghost town, despite its name, was booming. But the land had lost something, too. By the early 1950s, there was no longer any farming going on at Knott's Berry Farm. All that kind of work had moved off-site to other farmland bought by the Knots over the last decade as the ghost town grew. One could be forgiven for forgetting that the entire enterprise of ghost town was supposed to be supporting the chicken dinner restaurant. In truth, of course, the chicken dinners were now playing second fiddle to the Old West attractions Walter Knott was growing. Hey friends, thanks for watching all the way to the end of this video. Here's a couple more you might like, and if you would, please hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up. It literally costs you nothing except a few seconds, and it truly helps us make more videos like this one. An extra special thanks go out to the people helping us over on Patreon. 
It's because of their support that you're seeing this video right now. If you want to help the channel out even more, head over to our Patreon and check it out. You can find it through a link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great day.